Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this IREI webinar. I'm Chase McWhorter, Managing Director of Infrastructure at IREI. Uh, the point of this webinar is uh, it's designed to be a primer for our upcoming annual conference, VIP Infrastructure, taking place in Toronto next month, uh, actually in two weeks. Um, the theme of our discussion today is uh, where are infrastructure investors allocating capital and why? I'm joined by Sid Vital, who is the, uh, an infrastructure specialist at Mercer Alternatives. He's based out of Toronto uh, and focuses on uh, the North American market. Thank you for joining us, Sid. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we're scheduled for uh, 30 minutes on this webinar. Um, 20 minutes, we're going to do Q&A with Sid. And then uh, for everyone joining us, uh, we're going to open it up to questions for the last 10 minutes. Um, we're breaking up the, uh, the webinar into really three segments. So first we're gonna talk about uh, overall infrastructure allocation, then we're gonna to jump to ESG, uh, and then we're gonna talk about the LP-GP relationship. Um, the first section actually, before we get into those three is uh, just to learn a little bit more about uh, Sid and his background. So uh, Sid, to start off the questions, uh, just for context for our audience, uh, yeah, please provide some background on uh, your services, regions you cover, and uh, clients you advise. Yeah, thanks very much, Chase. Uh, so I've spent um, most of my career in infrastructure, and, and prior to Mercer, I, um, um, I, I worked as a, a developer um, on, on the developer side and the financial advisor side and, and on the lending side as well. Um, and, and now I've been at Mercer about four years. Uh, at Mercer, we, uh, we provide infrastructure as part of our broader Mercer alternatives, uh, which covers private mark all private market asset classes as well. So we do both um, advisory uh, as well as semi-discretionary and fully discretionary um, services. And, uh, and we, we do primaries, which is fund investments. We do secondaries, um, which is when LPs sell stakes in, in managers. Uh, and then we also do um, co-investments alongside managers. Uh, so we have um, we have over three billion in discretionary capital that we manage from over a um, hundred clients globally, and uh, we manage over um, and we advise on over ten billion um, across more than two hundred non-discretionary clients. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and then broadly, um, so what are you seeing uh, overall from overall LP allocations? So how are the portfolios evolving uh, this year? How is the uh, infrastructure portion in particular being impacted? Yeah, thanks. Uh, look, maybe it's useful to provide some context uh, to that question as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, infrastructure, um, as everyone knows, has been a, uh, uh, a very strong performing asset class um, and has garnered a lot of interest um, from LPs globally. Uh, so roughly, about 500 billion has been raised over the last decade in infrastructure. Uh, to put that in perspective, um, over the same time frame, private equity has raised about uh, almost three trillion over the last 10 years, um, and uh, and approximately, you know, anywhere between 200 and 250 uh, billion of dry powder is in infrastructure. And again, private equity is, um, you know, again about you know five to six times that number. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, you know, on, on average, depending on what, what you've been looking at the last few years, you know, we've seen funds raising. Um, it's also how you count because they count based on when the final close uh, reaches as opposed to the whole fundraising. You know, you're looking at the last two, three years has been anywhere between, you know, 70 and 100 billion raised annually. Mm -hmm. um, look, I mean, I'm speaking from a Canadian perspective, um, and I think it, you know, I think that's similar to, to some global LPs, uh, not all, but... Um, you know, as it's is the pension plan size in many cases um, determines their their allocation, um, their their size and sophistication, and I guess their 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 um, obviously their ALM as well uh, needs. Uh, so you know, when you're looking over sort of I I categorize them into three categories. You've got the over five billion, uh, you've got the one to five billion, and then the under one billion. So over five billion, you know, in Canada. Um, you know, we're seeing allocations of 15%, uh, even even creeping up sometimes to mm. depending 15 to 20 if they do a real assets um, type of sleeve. You know, one to five, maybe, you know, maybe closer to 10%. Uh, 
Uh, and then the below 1 billion is, is where I think there's a lot of, still a lot of opportunity to, to educate um, clients and because that, that's more say maybe 5% or even below that, if mm -hmm. anything at all. So. Hopefully they're tuning in right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so jumping to uh, specifically the infrastructure allocation, uh, So what are you seeing from the generations and sectors uh, they're investing in infrastructure? So, I mean, look, the, the first word is, is digital. Um, you know, if I, uh, uh, if I had a dollar for every time I um, saw a digital deal in, 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 in the infrastructure space, the last six months or 12 months, it's, it's just been, um, it, it's, it's been wild. Um, there, there's definitely been significant pickup and activity, both in um, all aspects. I, I say digital to encompass cell towers, um, also fiber um, and data centers. So, um, so it's a pretty broad asset class in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but that definitely with the move to 5G, uh, the need for bandwidth, data consumption, video, um, and just higher speeds. I mean, that, that's definitely a very, um, you know, been, been in vogue and, and a very strong sector uh, with a lot of deals going on. Um, you know, I'd say the, the midstream space, uh, we've seen the MLPs in the US, um, have been beaten up lately. Mm -hmm. uh, some cases for structural reasons, for because it was a FERC uh, sort of regulation that went through, which didn't allow a certain income tax allowance that they, they used to be allowed to recover. Um, but also just because they've been out of favor with the markets, so we've seen some take privates um, and opportunities there to get, um, so, so a lot of GPs pursuing um, deals in that space um, as well. Um, I mean, out, outside of that, um, uh, look, I mean, we think renewables are um, are interesting, just a very heavily competed space. Mm -hmm. uh, returns have, um, have definitely been compressed in that space, uh, but it's it's one that's still obviously of interest and in, in, with um, and growing renewable energy, you know, power generation as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, regionally, I'd say, um, you know, other regions like Chile have, have gained in provenance. Um, you know, we are seeing more activity in, in places like Chile over the last three to five years, even Eastern Europe, places mm -hmm. like Poland, the Czech Republic, um, have seen some transactions. Okay. Uh, and then same question for uh, the LP side. So what are you seeing from the LP community in regards to what region sectors they like? I, I mean, look, I think that's, um, again, that again, it depends on, uh, it's hard to have a one size fits all for all LPs. And, and again, depending on the level of sophistication, um, their size and their needs, uh, right? Often what we see at least is when an LP is making a single allocation to the sector, um, then they end up going with, um, you know, a global type of fund because it's, they, they can, they can take that bucket and, and, you know, they, they're not concentrated mm -hmm. um, um, as, as much in any, in any region for, per se. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, what we try to advise at Mercer is, is to ensure diversification, not just across, um, across regions when you build a portfolio, but across revenue drivers by, of the underlying assets. Um, okay. And if you're making a single allocation, um, you know, across managers, revenue drivers, and regions, right? So mm -hmm. it's not overly concentrated in any single, um, any single area. Um, you, you know, I mean, outside of that, we do have regional funds doing well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think there are some very well-known um, European-focused funds that have done really well. Same thing in North America as well that have that have done uh, very well in that space and that are still um, garnering a lot of interest. So, so I'd say from the LP side, it's really been driven more by um, the strength of the GP's um, track record there um, in, in those cases, right in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know the names I'm thinking of that have done really well in in both those regions. Uh, we haven't seen. Yeah as much as in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, so. Interesting. Uh, what types of, speaking of the funds, what types of funds, uh, all the way from mega funds to smaller funds and then strategies, so mid-market focus, but what types of funds and strategies uh, are gaining traction right now and why do you think? And then what types of funds and strategies are starting to fade and why do you think on that end too? So again, strategies and uh, fun types that are gaining traction than others that are maybe falling to the wayside. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, look, I think what you're seeing in infrastructure is a, um, it's been a very successful asset class that, that's only still in the early innings, I think, and is still very much growing. Mm -hmm. 
both in terms of not just in terms of capital it's raising, but also in terms of the, the breadth of the sector. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing is, um, you know, I'd say almost 80, 70, 80% of the capital that, that's being raised is being raised by uh, maybe 15 funds. Mm -hmm. so, so there's certainly um, a, a concentration um, of, of funds that have really um, been very successful. Uh, mm -hmm. And those funds have been moving arguably further up market as their fund sizes have been doubling and, and getting larger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that being said, obviously valuations have also come up uh, at the same time. So, so what you paid for five years ago, if you wanted to buy the same asset today, you're probably paying uh, significantly more for the same asset today. So you mm -hmm. could argue raising more capital just to keep up with the market in that sense. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, look, I, so I, I'd say when we started off, maybe, or looking at, you know, when I, when I, when I started off, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, 10 years ago or something, looking at the, just the pre-GFC funds or just after GFC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had the mid-market funds, sort of sub 2 billion, um, sub 3 billion, you know, you know, there's very few of those uh, left, um, I'd say, and, and, and I think that could be interesting if you can find uh, um, mid-market funds that... Uh, with, with, a, with a strong track record as well. So, mm -hmm. um, so let's see, let's, we're, now we're gonna go to uh, ESG. Uh, so what are, what are you looking for uh, from GPs regarding uh, operations to improve ESG? So I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of focus on the E part, but what are you looking for from the GPs regarding operations to improve that uh, overall? That's a good, uh, great question, and and we've spent um, a lot of time at Mercer on on ESG. Um, we have a, a dedicated responsible investments team mm -hmm. um, that that actually goes very, you know very in depth. That have worked with um, the Inter American um, Development Bank to develop uh, ESG principles alongside them, uh, and that have worked with a number of Canadian public pension funds as well to look at their portfolios and uh, and estimate the impact of climate risk on their assets. Um, so we've got a dedicated team that actually does uh, full in-depth ESG studies. Um, but look, I think ESG is more than about being reactive. It's more than risk mitigation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about being proactive and it's about value enhancement. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we try to understand fundamentally is, is ESG um, an inherent part of your investment decision-making process? Mm -hmm. So that means starting from the pre-screening of assets uh, to taking it to investment committee uh, and all the way to, through to asset management. Uh, and you are seeing more funds now, um, I think hiring a dedicated ESG person who mm -hmm. has a remit to understand the overall portfolio and try to drive synergies or ESG uh, across the whole portfolio. Um, so in our view, it's, it's definitely very, um, it's something that should be very proactive and, and, and can be an opportunity as opposed to a risk if mm -hmm. done right. Got it. Uh, and, and what we like to see is, is you know, quantifiable metrics to the extent possible. So if it's social, if it's government, if it's, um, you know, it could be, excuse me, it could be, you, you know, anything from safety, uh, you know, safety and labor to quantification of, um, you know, carbon um, or, or, or saved greenhouse gases to, you know, to, to governance on the board, but, mm -hmm. but being actual decisions and actions that have been taken um, and, and what the resulting impact of that was. And so, I mean, in that vein, so what are you looking for regarding reporting to, to improve ESG? Uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. I think that's very much um, uh, a work in progress in, in the sense, mm -hmm. I think there are very different reporting um, standards or, or diff, you know, differences between manager to manager mm -hmm. uh, and might just be a function of, it's not like, uh, it's not like reporting financial statements where everybody's got to follow, um, you know, gap, or um, you know, yeah. internationally recognized principles. You don't, you don't, you don't have that. We, we, you do have Gresby now. So mm -hmm. Gresby is an organization that that scores ESG across certain metrics. But mm -hmm. um, I'd say it's still not. You know, it's, it's not like accounting principles uh, where it's standardized and audited, obviously. So, yeah. um, so I mean, that that's an area for for growth. I think. Interesting. Uh, so now jumping to uh, third last segment before we open up for questions. So. Anybody listening and start thinking of what you want to to fire at Sid or myself. Um, so, 
LP GP relationship. So what makes a good relationship for LPs, uh, for GPs with LPs? Uh, so this is from a GP, uh, from an LP perspective. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, look, I think, um, some of these might be obvious, but it's things like transparency, mm -hmm. um, clear communication, um, and, um, uh, and clear direction. Uh, I mean, it sounds, sounds very simple, but, mm -hmm. um, if, even when it comes to things like understanding how a GP may use a line of credit, um, understanding the purpose of the facility. Um, so actually seeing what you're going to do and then doing what you said you would do, uh, yeah. following through with it, it again, sounds very simple. Um, and then, I, you know, I think a certain degree of, of transparency, uh, you know, I don't think LPs are asking to give away all their competitive advantages, um, or their secret sauce. Yeah. But at the same time, when it comes to, um, co-investments or when it comes to, uh, getting detailed information on assets, uh, things of like that, where, um, where, you know, could be, um, could be important to an LP, you know, I think being able to share that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, next question in, in the same LP GP relationship. So, uh, obviously there's a rise of, uh, mega funds, there's concerns of style drift. Um, there's the expanding definition of infrastructure. These are all things that we even hear. Um, so, what what would you say is a natural evolution of the infrastructure asset class and what would you say is more a function of late cycle investing okay it's putting me on the spot there but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh look uh and here come know, the questions I, on the <laughs> <laughs> uh, look i mean i mean i mean definitely i, th I think some a natural evolution is um is digital. I, th I think, I think, a lot, and I, you know, I want to be careful when I say that, I mean, that's a very broad asset class. And, and I think every deal in that sector is very different. Um, but I think there are certain assets that have the characteristics in that space um, of having long-term contracted cash flows that are essential assets, um, you know, strong offtake and strong counterparty um, and have those characteristics. There's, there's, again, there's other assets within the space that are, um, you know, that are more akin to private equity, I'd say with uh, very strong growth, but less contracted and, and much more mm -hmm. CapEx based. Um, so more of a private equity style model with a high exit multiple, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, so I think digital, I mean, cause the way I think about it is um, if you thought about what was essential, maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, everybody would say, you know, transport or cars uh, is, was essential obviously. and 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 I think today, you, you, if you survey at least most young people, they'd rather have a phone than a car. Uh, so, so you look at, or, so you look at what's essential, what's infrastructure, uh, and I think what powers that phone or, or backs that up. And, uh, so, so it makes sense that the, the sector should evolve. Is my point. You know, you should, you don't need to be just investing in just because twenty years ago you did, you did highways to keep it really simple, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's tough for me to to pick a single uh, single sector or space and say this is not infrastructure. I mean, I think it's comes down to the characteristics mm -hmm. uh, of that asset. I think there's certainly things that we've seen that uh, that make us a bit wary. Uh, I, I mean, with renewable power, even for example, that's certainly infrastructure. Um, but you know, there's just certainly deals that we've seen where um, there's significant merchant exposure. Mm -hmm. A lot of return is really driven by merchant exposure. Um, and there, there I question, uh, I question sometimes if, if that's true infrastructure in, in that sense, even though the asset itself is clearly is infrastructure. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. And again, I'm sure we're going to have to, I would, I would anticipate this is where we're going to get questions. So we might be going back to it, but, uh, so last question of just our Q and a segment before we go to, to the question. So, um, what are the issues, challenges that you see that keep the LPs awake at night. So, and what are, what has, and what has investors excited about infrastructure? So what's terrifying them at night? And then, yeah, what are they excited about? No, no fair. Um, so I think valuations, definitely you talk to anybody today and um, across, I think almost any asset class and, and they'll tell you valuations are high. Um, mm -hmm. So that being said, I think asset management is, is even more critical today than it was five or 10 years ago um, because 
the way to drive value creation with these assets may not necessarily come from multiple expansion. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the way we look at co-investments is, is to assume the same multiple on exit or, or sometimes even a contraction, um, and then try to understand what the value creation story is from an operational standpoint. Um, so definitely valuations, um, I mean, I think fund sizes, um, you know, again, across that's true for almost every private markets asset class, I think, whether it's private equity or real estate or infra, um, mm -hmm. gotten bigger. Uh, look, I, I think managers have, have been very good, generally speaking, at deploying capital uh, to date, in, uh, and there's been significant opportunity to do so. And, and the asset class, as you noted, is also is growing. Um, mm -hmm. So it makes sense for the asset class to, for funds to get bigger to some degree. Uh, you know, but there may be cases there where, um, you know, maybe, maybe some are too big relative to the opportunities that they're chasing. Um, you know, it's an obvious one. And, and I think, um, you know, un, unrealized, I would say unrealized valuations um, to, are, are of concern to me when, when funds are out there raising their next fund. Mm -hmm. um, especially when they're unrealized with, with limited cash yield. Um, yeah. and, and then all you have to go by is a business plan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know the the proof is is really in the pudding. Only when you sell, yeah, uh, or exit an asset. So that's that's definitely something um, that's concerning. So. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So, so that wraps up the the ten Q and A. So now we can go to some questions. Uh, so from Matthew Dixon, uh, are you seeing an increase in LP uh, LPs transacting or requesting co investments with GPs? Uh, look, I mean, I think definitely, um, you know, co-investments are very much uh, a hot word these days. And, uh, and and I think there are more LPs that we have seen globally that have asked for it. I, I think at the same time, um, you know, a lot of LPs that want to do it are not equipped to do it, just mm -hmm. given, the, given the resource constraints, um, sometimes the time scales and the time frames provided. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'd be, I'd be cautious in advising um, LPs and, in, in, in doing in in doing it, I mean, they, they certainly can be certainly can be very beneficial to to a portfolio, um, but but only if you're willing to take and are able to truly assess the concentration risk of those assets. Yeah, and also are willing to act within those timeframes and have the resources to do so, or or are able to um, hire somebody that can that can do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Uh, so this is going back to we talked about midstream. So. How long do you believe the opportunity in U.S. midstream assets will last before the demand for oil and gas slows? Yeah, I mean that's uh, that, that's that, that's a great question. Look, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm definitely not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not an uh, an oil guru, so I, I definitely don't claim, um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. And um, you know, that being said, um, you, you know, Mercer has done a lot of work in in this space, as I said, with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and trying to assess the impact on portfolios. And, and a recent um, study they did was along with uh, Cambridge Econometrics uh, to develop forecasting assumptions. Um, and, uh, and some of their assumptions where they've, they've modeled with increasing climate change, um, uh, you know, for example, they, they model that, that in Canada where the, it's more expensive, the, the oil, um, they forecast by, you know, by 2050, um, you might have limited to no exports uh, from from Canada, um, assuming you have a two to three Celsius increase in, in climate and given the the shift in uh, in power generation resources. I mean, I think that's an extreme uh, that that's probably a, a very extreme uh, way to look at it, maybe. But uh, uh, but that stranded asset risk is definitely something very important to keep in mind when you make co investments. Yeah. Um, let's see. Make sure I'm looking at this right um do you expect rising allocations uh to emerging markets infrastructure and if so where so you briefly touched on chile i don't know how you'd factor them in but yeah do you expect rising allocations to to emerging markets yeah, look um our, our client base is primarily and uh, sitting in toronto canada primarily canadian um and, and in the US. Um, so I, I have seen 
I think there's been enough infrastructure funds doing OECD or global funds mm -hmm. uh, with strong track records now where LPs choose to allocate to them. Uh, you know, I definitely think emerging markets, I think we had um, um, the, the former head of the World Bank who was hired by GIP uh, mm -hmm. in Berlin talking mm -hmm. about emerging markets and talking about how, um, you know, not all emerging markets are the same and, and some are definitely far more advanced than others. And uh, we're definitely seeing a lot of interest from the GPs in, in emerging markets as part of a global fund. Mm -hmm. um, the more and more of them are allocating, um, definitely making allocations to two places like, um, you know, India, China, um, mm -hmm. and, and elsewhere. Uh, so we are seeing more activity there. Um, I personally haven't covered as many Asia dedicated infrastructure funds so mm -hmm. I can for that, but, uh, but definitely seeing more activity in that. Space. Would, would you say the main issue or concern for emerging markets is currency risk or political risk? I mean, anything in emerging market that you would, you would point to that would be a concern or yeah. your top concern? Look, I, yeah, I think it's a combination, um, mm -hmm. right, of regulatory, political, legal, currency. Um, you know, there have been some managers that have been, that have built up a very strong emerging markets track record. Um, mm -hmm. You know, names like Actis come to mind, who mm -hmm. have raised at least three or more dedicated emerging markets funds and have done quite well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I do think to be successful in emerging markets, you need to have a presence on the ground. Yeah. Or you need to have an affiliation on the ground um, because it's hard to do it from sitting from an office in London or New York. Uh, that's for, for sure. Um, and I think knowing the local players, um, having those relationships uh, is, is definitely important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think currency is, is, is definitely um, also a big one. Uh, and, um, and I think being able to have um, either some sort of a inflation um, escalator built in into the revenue contract mm -hmm. um, or some sort of a USD hedge is, is probably also important. So, okay. uh, so all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just trying to give some insights in what they could address in, in those yeah. discussions. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned valuations uh, this late in the cycle. Yeah. Uh, what strategies do you see GPs adopting to work and still make good investments in this environment? Yeah, so um, good question. So I, th I think one is definitely a, um, what we see is common is, is a platform approach, right? Mm -hmm. Where you build a platform in a certain sector and then you try to creatively go and add on, bolt on investments to that platform. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're able to then maybe go down market a bit um, in, to transactions you may not otherwise look at because they're below your below the um, either the equity investment threshold and maybe a bit smaller, um, but then this way there's less competition and you're able to drive hopefully some economies of scale and synergies by bolting these assets on to the platform. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's that's definitely one. Uh, you know we we certainly you know what's what's been nice to see I think is you know we have seen. Um, a lot of managers spending a lot of time on, on frankly, asset management and optimization of these assets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, infrastructure is not a passive business. Uh, it's not like buying a listed equity fund. It's it's a very, uh, you, you know, you, it's a very hands-on business, and these are operating, functioning businesses and assets that have, yeah, um, that have their issues. So so having a value creation plan, um, having a network of advisors you can lean on. Um, with specifically with sectoral expertise in the spaces that you're targeting. Um, so that's, that's been comforting to see, I think for many managers. Um, so those are really the two main ways. Mm -hmm. um, so another question just came in. So uh, Sid, do you share any comments on uh, niche funds, fund trends across uh, different LP segments? Uh, context is water, uh, waste management as a specialist area. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we have looked at a few sector focused funds, um, in, in, uh, in water, digital, um, transport, um, uh, as well. I mean, typically what we've seen at least with water is the, the pipeline of 
of deal flow, uh -huh. uh, and both the size of the deals. Um, so my plan has not been as steady and the size of the deals is typically smaller relative to funds being raised today. Um, so I think they've, they've tended to be a subset of a strategy for most funds as opposed to a, um, a fully dedicated water fund. Yeah. Just because they, they're just not enough of them um, mm -hmm. yet at least. Um, so that's the extent to which I can comment on that. I mean, we have seen, uh, I think a few desal plants. Um, there are definitely some water utilities. I mean, that being said, and um, you know, unfortunately the UK with, with the water regulator, um, they did have a revision downward, which has mm -hmm. uh, affected some of the, the funds interest in, in water regular, you know, I'd say water acquisitions in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but you know, not, not in North America. So. Got it. Um, let's see here. I mean, we're right at our 30 minutes. I'm just, I want to give people some more time. Uh, anyone listening got a, maybe a couple minutes to, we can extend longer if we have more questions, but, uh, you got to get your questions in soon. Um, I guess one thing quickly for you said, as far as, you know, it's not everybody's favorite subject, but benchmarks, I mean, yeah. what are you, what are you seeing? In, <laughs> And, and we've been told to stop talking about it sometimes, but <laughs> we just uh, from your perspective, I mean, are you seeing uh, improvements in, in benchmarks uh, since you've been covering the industry? Uh, you know, I'm not sure I'm best placed to answer that. I mean, we certainly look at uh, the, what we look at is, is, um, is vintage year peer, peer group analysis. And that's mm -hmm. what we feel is the best way to look at these, uh, these assets. And the other thing that we look at is, is public market equivalents mm -hmm. um, with the public indices, which basically tries to simulate um, drawdowns and distributions in the public markets. So that you're buying in or selling along, mm -hmm. alongside when your drawdowns just distributions would have, would have taken place in a fund. Mm -hmm. um, you know, otherwise it's peer group analysis. I mean, look, our view is in private markets. Yeah. The most relevant is peer group analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, another question just came in. So, uh, has, uh, has the market given up on the U S P three market? Are there any encouraging signs at all from your point of view? Uh, uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, that's, that's been, um, that's been going on for, uh, years or decades now. Um, yeah, I think we have seen some activity in that space. Um, uh, you know, I think recently I saw a few airport parking deals, mm -hmm. uh, taking place through a P three. Um, and, and there seems to be some more momentum behind P3s there. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful, cautiously optimistic that, uh, that, that we'll see more. Um, time okay. will come. Yeah. Uh, okay, a couple more questions just came in. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, do you see the pace of deals uh, accelerating, slowing down, or uh, yeah, increasing over the coming year. Um, certainly, there's more capital in the space, but it appears the broader global economy may be due to a, uh, due for a slowdown. So, I just saw this morning. I know Morgan Stanley's sounding the alarm on the yield curve. So, I mean, what are you seeing as far as, or what are you anticipating? I guess acceleration, slowdown, increase in deal flow. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um uh, that's been interesting, right? Because we've seen more capital being raised, but the pace of deployment has also gotten a lot faster, which yeah. is why we see larger funds, or at least we've seen larger funds coming back to market, mm -hmm. um, you know, well within the investment period. Um, yeah. deploying 70, they hit the 70% threshold for deploying capital before they can come back to market within, you know, within two years, three years. So yeah. which is well under the typically are allotted four to five years for that. Mm -hmm. um, so the pace deployment has been very strong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most managers I speak to still say that the opportunity set is very large and, and only growing larger. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, unless, unless there's a correction in the, in the debt markets uh, because leverage is also plentiful and, and I think deals are taking place right now and, um, and there's both equity and debt capital available. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you know, I would think you need to have some kind of catalyst, either um, some some kind of debt slowdown or 
um, or some kind of hiccup in the markets that that prevents that slows deals down um, for, yeah. for, for the pace to really slow down um, and you know we are late cycle so um, you know we're, we're, we're cautious mm-hmm. uh, but it's hard for me to say you know what could trigger that um, you, you know I what I can say is this, this will probably not go on another 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The same, you know, we're uh, uh, at the same pace. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and we've I mean, covered it a few times from different people, but I mean, the idea that infrastructure is in a lot of cases defensive. I mean, yeah. that if there is a slowdown, then it would make sense that if investors are concerned, they're going to put more funds into private infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting, actually. So, I mean, in some cases, a correction, if it's not severe, um, could actually be an opportunity for some of these funds. Um, so because some funds, many funds I speak to say it's just so expensive right now that they're losing bids and they're not able to make deals work because it's so expensive. So yeah. a little bit of a correction could be a good thing. You might actually see more capital being deployed if there's yeah. and uh, ironically. Yeah. Well, and I, and I would say even raise. Right? Yeah. I know surveys even last year, I mean, obviously the equity markets with their chaos at the end of the year, I mean, what you saw was a lot of mandates come out to go to infrastructure. So, I mean, it seems like everything's good for infrastructure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Can you, can you comment on the uh, renewable energy infrastructure market? So I guess this is just more broadly. I mean, what's your, your general feeling? I know you briefly touched on it, but maybe just a recap of kind of how you feel about the renewable energy market. No, absolutely. So I think, um, look, I think renewable power is definitely, um, you know, we're seeing it at, in, in many states and uh, jurisdictions almost at uh, market parity. So levelized cost of energy has now come down where it's workable without subsidies in many regions or most regions um, in developed markets now, uh, which is definitely a big positive. We don't have to rely on government subsidies and potentially that being um, retracted mm-hmm. to, uh, for things to not work. Um, so that's, that's one, I think that's very positive. Uh, you know, solar and, and wind are, are very much, I'd say mainstream, mm-hmm. um, today, I think offshore wind has, has also come a long way. Offshore wind is definitely more complex construction operations wise, um, you know, for obvious reasons being, being out in the ocean or sea. Um, you know, that being said, um, you know, we, even offshore wind, um, I think on the secondary markets operating offshore wind assets or trading it um, uh, if you're a seller at very strong, uh, you know, very strong multiples and mm-hmm. a lot of interest in those kinds of assets as well. Um, you, you know, I, I think renewables is, is, is one where the technology is getting better um, and, and it's improving. Um, it, it, you know, I, I think the concern there is more merchant exposure and, and being able to secure uh, corporate PPAs, um, or PPAs that, that are able to justify um, uh, a more defensive investment mm-hmm. um, in, in the space. Um, and, and also then the other risk is, is also we've seen um, where the corporate PPA price that you, that you end up choosing, um, where you settle that, um, that, that also matters because that might not be the actual price of delivering the actual electricity depending on where mm-hmm. the, that gets settled. Yeah. Um, that's another risk to watch out for. I think uh, basis risk, uh, but but look outside of that, merchant power risk and basis risk are I think the two two big ones, uh, or merchant price risk. Um, mm-hmm. But the sector as a whole, I think I think is is um, is here to stay, and, and yeah. only becoming more mainstream. Yeah. Well, I think it was uh, we actually hosted a roundtable in New York, and I think the statistic, still trying to verify, but it was yeah. almost two thirds, seventy percent of new broadly energy projects were renewable. Yeah, so yeah. I mean even though globally oil and gas, traditional fossil fuels are still the majority by a pretty wide margin, it seems like even the development aspect is moving towards renewables. Um, I think that does it for for the questions. Um, yeah, so I guess we can um, shut it down from here unless someone wants to type in one real quick. Uh, we can close it down, but no, thank you, Sid, for taking the time. We know you're, you're a busy man. So appreciate you taking the time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll be seeing you in a couple weeks in, in Toronto. Um, what, uh, nope, that's not a question. Um, 
So what a uh, when are the what a uh, what are you taking for the Raptors game six? Or... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know this, this is big, first time, first time ever for us. So uh, uh, you know I, I hope uh, you know we'll have to see how game one goes. But uh, uh, you know this this is going to be a challenge like I think nothing we faced before. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah, hopefully hopefully Raptors in seven. <laughs> Raptors in seven. All right. Wow. Well, and we I think we'll be there if they if they take it that far, then, then yeah. we'll be in uh, Toronto at the time. That's, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, we'll shut it down there. And uh, if you have questions, email me directly, uh, and we'll try to get you an answer. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sid. Thanks so much, Chase. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>